Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Peinecker, and I have a special co-host here. Many of you know him because of his awesome book, which, by the way, I just got somebody just mess- uh, sent them a uh, message me saying, I just bought the book, uh, The Burning Book, uh, co-authored uh, with James Goldberg, a Jewish Mormon memoir, which, by the way, I haven't been pushing it much because of the whole breaking news situation in Israel, but it is this month's book giveaway. So I do have in the description and link for to my email and make sure if you want to enter it that you put in the subject heading October book drawing and give me your address in the body of the email. So check that out. So now I'm so um, honored and privileged to have this gentleman come on my program. Actually, Jason helped facilitate this uh, this interview. And the gentleman's name is Jabra Ganem. Ganem? Right, Ganem. I got it. Yes. yes. And got Jabra... It is a fascinating guy. He's actually the CEO of Global Language Systems, and he got his PhD at where? BYU. And what was it in? Yeah, in Inquiry, Measurement, and Evaluation. See, I asked, I said, you're going to say it, because I I, I can't handle that. And you you also got your master's (laughs) in in economics as well. Economics, yes. So, and, but what makes you so interesting is that you are a, uh, you, you, you trace your lineage. You're a Palestinian you you have come from a Christian family, yes. but interestingly enough, and this is what's so fascinating, folks. I'm going to have Jabra on multiple multiple times because he got a fascinating story. Did you know that he was the very first person baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints in Jordan? And did you know that he's currently working on an Arabic edition of the Book of Mormon? Yes, that's two episodes right there. And so <laughs> we're going to have Jabra come back on to talk about that. But the main reason we're having Jabra on is because. You bring bring a very unique perspective as somebody who's Arab, Palestinian. Uh, you 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 uh, of course this hits home for you. What's happening to your people, mm-hmm. and what's also happening to the Jewish people? Okay, yes. Israeli yes. citizens of all stripes. Okay, yes. and uh, we had a fantastic conversation last week, and I said, guys, guys, let's let's stop, stop, stop. We got to save this for the audience. <laughs> And we had to do that early on before we started taping. We started talking about other things. We could talk for two hours, but we're, we're just going to have this be a relatively short episode. I want to introduce my audience to Jabra because I think he brings a very important voice to the table. Of course, many of you know, I've been talking to many people from different orth- Orthodox to uh, to r- r- uh, different uh, aspects of Judaism, also Christian organizations that are working with the Jewish people. But I'm also talking to Muhammad, who's a, a Muslim philosopher and historian writer who lives in the Gaza Strip. And I've been talking with him too. And I've been, for those of you who watch my shorts, I've been doing a series of shorts about Muhammad and his situation as well. Now, I just found out more about Muhammad, interesting guy. He he went to Christian schools, was raised going to Christian schools, and he was breastfed by a Christian woman as a baby. So he has a unique story to tell as well. And that's what I told, I told Muhammad, I said, listen, I said, when it comes to the Middle East, there are good Jews. There are good Christians. There are good Muslims. There are good Arabs. There are good atheists. But there's also bad in all those camps when it comes to the Middle East as well. And the important thing is we want to have all the good people platformed on my program. Jabra, welcome to the program today. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I really appreciate you having me. And, you know, I think I just want, and again, we're going to have you back on to talk about other things, but I just want you to kind of talk about, okay, you go to bed Friday night, two weeks ago, and you wake up in the morning, and then you see that hell has broken out in Israel. Yes. Hamas, what they did is almost unspeakable. And of course, I've said they are a nihilistic death cult. Mm -hmm. Right? I want you to tell me, what was it like when you woke up that morning and you saw the headlines? What was the first thing that hopped in your head? Uh, the context. So I have been, so for the last maybe two years, I haven't been in social media. I do not have news in the house. My source of news is my wife. When something happens in the world, she tells me. And usually that isn't much to say. I'm totally focused on other things. I just decided... Watching the news isn't for me. It's more of the same all the time. And we wake up Saturday, getting ready to work out. And my wife rolls towards me and she says, look what's happening. And I just said, ah, what's happening? And then she shows me. And then 
I start scrolling and looking and then I go to the BBC and start listening. And in the beginning, you know, you think this is, this is, this can't be happening because so many lines, you know, lines that are metaphorically and literally drawn in the sand. And uh, I just couldn't imagine that Hamas would be so brazen to do this. But then initially you think, oh, maybe they're going after some military targets or whatever. But then you see civilians, you see, I mean, I know the area well. And you, I'm like, that's mostly kibbutzes. That's mostly kibbutzim there. These are civilians. And for like all of these people usually have very good relationships with their Arab neighbors and they employ people from the Gaza Strip. So it was it was just shock. And for a couple of hours, I just refused to look at it. And then my wife comes in and she says, no, you have to see this. This is horrible. And it's it's unfortunate for me to say this, but once you see it coming from CNN and the BBC and, you know, and then you go to Fox and Al Jazeera and all of these sources, and then the narrative starts being shaped up. And what I realize is going there is going on is basically are basically crimes against humanity. And, uh, and it's just unfortunate. And then, you know, as the days go by, you hear about children being kidnapped, people being attacked in a music festival, hundreds dead. Then you watch the numbers and you're like, wow, 900, 1,000, 1,400. And you realize that the scale, I mean, of course, as someone who knows the area, you know what the response will be to it. It's totally expected. But at that point, there is this sense of shame and sense of anger, a sense of empathy, sense of love towards the Israelis who are being subjected to all of this. And my gut instinct is this is this this is this is an atrocity in the making, and this is not the end of it. And of course, the week goes goes by, two weeks go by, and then you realize babies being killed, tortured. There is even news that I haven't seen confirmation of it, of children being burned and beheaded. And you, as someone who studied the history of the Jewish people in depth, as someone who has great love and respect for the Jewish people and their tradition, I'm just horrified, and I'm like, this is exactly this is exactly what Jews do not need. And then it's a moment of you have to sit down and reevaluate. In this case, in my case, reevaluate you know 50 years of ideas, you know that I've been exposed. Now I was in the process. I've been for the past five years in the process of reevaluating things especially towards what's happening there. And I've reached a conclusion many years ago that violence is not the solution to this, that whatever it is that needs to happen is not going to happen by the force of arms or by violence or by anything. And of course, this narrative is shaped by a deeper understanding of the Book of Mormon. Uh, the Book of Mormon, actually, when you read it, has two great stories. One we talk about a lot and one we don't talk about a lot. One we kind of forget. But the first story is the one we talk about a lot is the story of the anti-Nephi Lehi's. Are you familiar with it? Yes, yeah. at the very dead center of the Book of Mormon, by the way. They Yeah, they bury the swords and they go and kneel before their enemies and they say, oh, we've shed so much blood, we've had enough. We'd rather die than shed more blood. And that's kind of an extreme example, but it's in line with the Christian spirit. But the other example that we don't talk about a lot is the example of the people of Alma, the people that Alma takes out of Lamanite territory. And 
they, the Zoramites, if you remember, he goes, he finds the suppressed people, they, they have been degraded to a slave status, and they are forbidden from worshiping with the rest of their population. So they convert, Alma takes them out, runs out, and he get, encounters the Lamanite army, and the Lamanite army puts the priests of Noah in charge of them. And of course, the priests of Noah establish a dictatorship and they forbid the people to pray and they oppress them in all sorts of ways. And Alma's response is that it's fine. If, if, they, if they do this to you, just pray in your heart. You, nothing is worth committing an act of violence. We, we're not going to get freedom by committing acts of violence. And these two stories... Shape, start shaping my ideas about this but then you know you, you the book of mormon is is again a story about what happens when two nations let fear vengeance anger rule them you notice in, in the book of mormon the nephites and the lamanites are always and and here is the the funny thing about not funny but the interesting thing about it is that Towards the end of the Book of Mormon, there are Lamanites who are Nephites and Nephites who are Lamanites, and that the term denotes if you're following God or not. But towards the end of it, they are engaged in this never-ending cycle of violence, and it ends up annihilating one of them. And the people who should know better, it annihilates the people who should know better, right? And the other thing that you notice in the Book of Mormon narrative about war and peace is that whenever the Nephites engage in war, even though their cause is just, even with Captain Moroni and you know the Banner of Liberty and all of that, whenever they engage in war, there is a hardening of heart. There is wealth and prosperity that follows, but then there is also a hardening of hearts that follows. And then you have whoever prophet is in charge at the time going out to the people, trying to soften their hearts, bring them back to the gospel and all of that stuff. So th these are the ideas that have been shaping my thinking about the whole Palestinian-Israeli struggle. And then you know, I started these relationships with rabbis in Israel, with with Chabad rabbis, with ultra-Orthodox rabbis, became very good friends with them, and we talk about these things. And, and you start having this love towards Torah, towards, you know, the Jewish narrative, and you realize we we need to we need to change. On the Arab side, we need to change our narrative. And we need to also listen to our Jewish brothers and sisters and listen to their historical narrative. Now, I know in our private conversation, I said we need to forget about the historical context, but and I'll clarify that in a minute. But what we need to do is, is listen to their narrative because to be completely and com completely frank and honest, in the last I'd say in the last hundred years, Arabs have not given a traumatized Jewish nation any reason to trust them or to to you know to to fully get into a peace process. There is always this caution, and you, you know what I'm referring to specifically is you know the endogenous Jewish populations in places like Iraq. Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, who, whether under the Ottoman Turks or under independent Arab nations, have been marginalized, kicked out of their homes. You know, a million Mizrahi Jews were kicked out of Arab lands that they've inhabited for hundreds of years. They were literally kicked out of it barefoot, right? And of course, they ended up mostly in Israel, and because much of this was happening during the during uh, the 1948 and beyond 1948 war and beyond. But you look at that, and then you look at the history of you know peace between the Palestinian Authority, the PLO, and Israel. And you, you have to have a certain level, I think, of intellectual integrity and look beyond the suffering of the Palestinian civilians and all of that stuff, which, which is heartbreaking. I mean, I have 
scores and scores of relatives over there and they suffer. But you also have to look at the consequences of a corrupt system of government, whether it's the Palestinian Authority or a dictatorial form of government in the form of Hamas, now that they have descended beyond dictatorial, now that now they've become basically a barbaric, you know, bloodthirsty, child killing, you know, organization. What in Book of Mormon speech, they've become robbers. They've become Gideonton robbers, basically. That's what they've descended into. And you look at all of that and you say, as Palestinians, we have to critique our people, our government, the people, and we might not have elected them. I, I tell you this, I tell you this, and there is no statistics to back me, but recent studies, I've, I've copied you in the group about it, showed that Hamas isn't popular in Gaza. The Palestinian Authority isn't popular in, you know, Judah and Samaria and the West Bank. If these people are not popular, but they are the ones we have. And we have to critique them. We have to tell them. Uh, we have to tell them the naked truth about who they are and that this can't go on. And we... You know, just Jabra, I just I also yeah. want to start you because you're talking about the historical context. And you said over the course of the last hundred years that the Jewish people have been mistreated by the, the Arabs. And this is the thing and I'm talking about the Arab, the Arab Jewish relationships in the last hundred years. I'm not yeah, this is the key. The this is the key because context. A, lot of, a lot of people want to make this about 1948, the state of Israel established. No, 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 no. People don't realize that the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Yes went, aligned himself with the Nazis, went to Auschwitz and implored them to work harder, kill as many of these Jews as you can. This is before the establishment of the state of Israel. Yes. This is not about what people are, the, the narrative that people are wanting to put out about this being some kind of an illegitimate state or whatever. You want to say there, the, this idea of destroying the Jewish people was there for a very long time and it was fed by Nazism, fascism, also the prodigals, the prodigals of the learned elders of Zion uh, garbage. It was put out by the the, the uh, Russia. Uh, in, and, and so you have this combination, this hundred year history of going to basically try to destroy the Jews even before the state of Israel existed. So those of yes. you who want to make this about the state of Israel, you are completely dead set wrong. No, that is absolutely. And I agree with that. That is, that is, I mean, that is the Arab Israeli Jewish, and I'm going to say Arab Jewish context, but then there is also the wider pogroms in Russia the Holocaust in Germany, the Ottoman Ottoman Empire's abuses, then you have the expulsion from Europe, the British, you know, during during World War II, even here in the United States, we wouldn't take Jewish ships right. full ships filled with Jewish refugees from Germany and from Europe. We sent them back to the Holocaust to die. And it's and this is this is what the Palestinians specifically, but the Arabs generally, need to understand. They need to understand this. They need to be learned in this. They need to be educated about it. There are a couple of stories I read recently that there is a Holocaust museum now in Dubai, which is, you know what? It, it wasn't given its due. But even if it was a room that acknowledged the Holocaust and to try to educate people about it and the ugliness of anti-Semitism, it's worth it. But, you know, there is also a story I read about in Gaza, uh, an English teacher who took the, the Merchant of Venice, which is a very anti-Semitic uh, play, however you read it, and it reflects a sentiment in England and Europe in general at the time. And they had uh, a bunch of Palestinian children read it in Gaza, in a school, and the children basically felt bad for Shylock, and they sided with him. And it's things, so that kind of, that one story specifically validates my point of view that Arabs, Palestinians need to read that narrative because the narrative we have, and it, it was just last night, you know, the IDF caught one of the terrorists who were caught, he had this paper written and he threw it on 
top of you know a civilian Israeli civilian body they they killed this person and through that and they refer to the Khaybar uh, massacres that Muhammad committed against the Jews in the Arabian Peninsula Th that's the narrative so Arabs Muslims specifically and even Eastern Christians even Eastern Christians okay are complicit in an anti-Semitic narrative that they refuse, like just on East, the Eastern Christians, there is this one page after the church in Gaza fell, uh, th there were comments calling Jews Christ killers, right? And that was, and I just had to react to that because it is anti-Semitism. But these are the narratives that Arabs need to be educated in. They, they need to learn it and they need to understand it and they need to understand why violence against Jews in any way, shape or form, verbal, physical, you know, saying stupid things like from the river to the sea, uh, saying death to Zionism, say, saying all of that stuff, all of these things are unnerving and they erode any grounds of trust that we can stand on to build a peaceful community together. They they just erode it. And even harboring those feelings in your mind or soul or having any place for it is not helpful. It's not going to stop the death of Palestinian kids in Gaza and the West Bank. And this is what it's all about. It's about all those children because the adults, you know, unfortunately, when we become adults, we become stupid, right? We we lose that innocence of childhood. Uh, we, you know, when I teach language to adults, I do, do a technique called infantilizing them, making them feel like infants to take away those inhibitions they have and preconceptions that they can't learn a language. And once you infantilize them, you can teach them language very quickly and easily. Mm. And I feel this is, how we need to do it with the whole of the Arab world. Because, I mean, even, even like last night, I was right before bed, okay? Usually I listen to scriptures before bed, but last night my sister sends me this interview with Queen Rania of Jordan. And Queen Rania, I, you know, I, she doesn't know me, I don't know her, but we went to similar schools in Kuwait together. We were literally neighboring schools. I've known about her family. She probably knew about mine because the community is very small. And I was just shocked. Like, here is this educated, intelligent. I know her to be very intelligent. She is, as, she's in this interview, and there isn't one word of acknowledgement of the Israeli children or the Israeli civilians uh, who have been killed and why this is happening, why this has been Hamas knew what would happen and they didn't care. Uh, whoever participated knew what would happen and they didn't care. And she was, she brings up all the Palestinian deaths, which is fine, but you cannot start to address something like this or be heard or your opinion be credible about it unless you acknowledge the humanity of those people who were killed in this horrible barbaric attack. You cannot. Like, and to me, once someone starts a conversation like that, I just cancel them. Uh, I'm not a, I'm not big on cancel culture, but I just cancel these people because it's disgusting. If you want people to pay attention to the dead Palestinian children, you have to pay attention equal, if not more attention to the dead Israeli children. One thing I've always wished I can tell my Arab and Palestinian friends, and I try to tell them gently, think of it this way. So I, I shared with you, I did this uh, DNA test uh, a while ago, and it comes back, and that is 22%, and 8% of it is Ashkenazi Jewish, Jewish blood. And I'm like, how could this be? I, I'm sure no one in our family is Ashkenazi. Like th this is, but it, here it is, it was there. And then I started doing family history. I started going, you know, I've done it before and I started digging deeper into it. And I could see where it could have come from because I have family who came from the Balkans 
and uh, from this place called Saloniki in Greece. And Saloniki was always a uh, like a Jewish Jewish hub before the Nazis came in and destroyed everyone. So, but then I thought about those Jews of Saloniki when I was reading about it. I read several books about Saloniki Jews, and you realize that when they wiped all the population of that place, when they killed all the Jews, when they murdered all the Jews who were there, think of yourself as a Jew trying to trace back your ancestry, and there is this big burning hole in the middle of your lines like that's it someone came in and took out generations of your family and deprived you from knowing the generations before and that was a tragedy think of it put your and that was a transformative moment for me thinking thinking of it from that perspective again i just think that Arabs need to know this. Muslims need to know this. Eastern Christians need to know this. You need to rid yourselves of anti-Semitism, be educated in what anti-Semitism is, and just take it out. Take it out and start fresh. And fortunately, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have a way we can do that. I mean, the atonement is all about you know, the savior of the world saying to us, come to me and I'll take everything that you've done before and I'll totally forget about it. Totally forget about it and start new with me. And we need to do that. And if, unless we do that, we're not Christians. We're not Christians. Uh, I don't know what to do about the Muslim narrative because unfortunately the Muslim narrative is is. And I say this with, with a heavy heart. It's steeped in this Islamic dominance of, of the world, right? They, they have no room. Like you're either, if you live with Muslims, they have to be, they have to be the, ruling, the ruling party. And I, to be, that, that's my biggest, my biggest uh, problem right now is how can we get Muslims to think differently about th these things and, and start anew and find, find a way to say we'll forget about everything? And uh... Well, you know, this is interesting because I think, and I want to bring Jason into this as well, because what has happened is that in, over the past 100 years, we've also had, seen a shift in Western Christianity in which uh, uh, the Vatican II, uh, right around the time of Vatican II, they they up until that point, the ca Catholic doctrine was that the Jews committed deicide; they were Christ killers, mm -hmm. and that is no longer Catholic doctrine. Um, yeah. We also have seen a shift in, especially in the American Protestant evangelical world, that conventionally, traditionally, would have been, uh, especially establishment mainline Protestants, Protestantism were anti-Semitic historically. Uh, but we also then saw the rise of Christian Zionism and pro-Israeli Christianity starting in, or Jewish, pro-Jewish Christianity starting to rise up in the 19th century. Uh, with the rise of Mormonism and dispensationalism and Seventh-day Adventism and all these other different groups, expressions that all kind of looked at the, the reestablishment of the uh, Jewish people, the nation of Israel, the state of Israel as being some kind of prophetic thing that would be fulfilled, which would then be established in 1948. So just maybe talk about the shifting narrative within Christianity, because you're an expert on this as well. Not only are you a, a renowned expert on Zionism, Jason, you also have taught, written a book about this as well, especially in lieu of the Six Day War. That's a low, long question, but I think you can unpack it really nicely. Well, th thank you, Steve, and thank you, thank you so much, Jabra. I I just want to say that what uh, what Jabra, what I think you're saying is just is so beautiful and is the foundation for peace, and that you have truly uh, converted your heart you know, to, to God and, and the, and the peace of, of Jesus. Um, and, uh, I, I'm so grateful that you've defined, um, anti-Semitism as a sin and that, that needs to, and sin requires repentance and mm -hmm. forgiveness. And, and we can, we can be forgiven, uh, for the sin of anti-Semitism, you know, and, and, and just, that that it's um any in any case I I just want to say that 
you know, I have been devoting, like like Jabra, you know, I, I've been devoting my research and my thoughts to to Arab Jewish peace. I mean, completely. Um, you know, in, in the political and diplomatic domain, I've seen that uh, express itself in the Abraham Accords. And Jabra mentioned uh, the United Arab Emirates. Uh, it's it it is no coincidence that the United Arab Emirates is recognizing Jewish humanity, recognizing the Holocaust, recognizing Judaism, and also creating space for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, the first Latter Day Saint temple in the in the Arab world. Yeah, the, these two things are connected. They're not. They're not mutually exclusive, um, and, and the Book of Mormon is very clear on that. The the attitude toward the Jewish people is connected to the attitude toward the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. If I may be so bold to say, you know, the Book of Mormon is is a Semitic book. <laughs> it's it, and it, it is full of uh, Semitic thought. That's why it's it's so easily translatable into Hebrew and Arabic. And so um, th there's a vision here that as children of Abraham, that uh, we can we can make peace, we can prosper together, we can um, protect one another. Um, and, and that's, you know, I, that's what I'm hoping I'm seeing. It, Israel worked very hard to to build peace treaties with with Egypt and Jordan, uh, as well as recently United Arab Emirates, Morocco, Bahrain, um, you know, and that we we have to create a community where we mutually protect each other and of course i mean uh i imagine that and i assume that these arab countries want the protection of palestinian children and they want the protection of their innocent arab brothers and sisters and so this this political and diplomatic framework of the abraham accords needs to have that spiritual and you know spiritual commitment so that um that we can protect one another i mean that's that's the the vision that i have is arabs and jews protecting each other which i think jabra shares entirely uh and it's 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 religious it's moral it's it's not just you know the um and and of course i have to preface you know i'm not i am not speaking for the united states and i am not speaking for the church of jesus christ of latter day saints um but what what Steve is getting at, and is that you know Christianity ha to start with has to be purged, and re not purged but repent of anti-Semitism. Um, the Book of Mormon is very clear and in and very direct in calling us for that. And I I do think some members of the church are ignoring the Book of Mormon's call for uh, repentance from anti-Semitism. But it's a beautiful thing that other forms of Christianity have found the conscience and the light of Christ on their own with, without the aid of the Book of Mormon, um, but because it's also a, a biblical message as well, um, that we shouldn't hate the Jewish people and we, sh we shouldn't hate any people. We shouldn't hate the Palestinian people. It's um, that the Book of Mormon has such beautiful ideas. I, I'm so grateful that Jabra um, pointed out the story of the Zoramites and the story of the anti Nephi Lehi's. The Book of Mormon itself is this paradox of of pluralism, actually, um, because you also have the uh, Captain Moroni, and you have the sons of Helaman, and you have uh, a very the concept of a Christ-like warrior um, that's presented in the Book of Mormon. I obviously lean more toward those stories; they resonate with me more. But I also can honor um, the space for a, a pacifist approach or a nonviolent approach. And um, there are different times and circumstances when each of these models comes into play. And I, I think I think Jabra's call for for nonviolence is is entirely legitimate. I would uh, and I honor that. and I would uh, I also, I mean personally just see, um, the the necessity of self defense as as critical. I think uh, you know Jewish history has demonstrated uh, with as recent as the Holocaust. I mean the Jewish people in Europe 
basically took a pacifist approach because they had no option. They were unable to arm themselves or defend themselves. And so the, the state of Israel is, is not going to repeat uh, that mistake. They, they're going to keep the, the 7 million Jews that are in the land of Israel alive. So, uh, yeah, Jabra, go ahead if you, it looked yeah, like you, had, I mean, you were thinking about something. Yeah, I mean, you, you, bring up, you bring up a very important point, which is, you know, the, the history. And this is something that baffled me the more I studied Jewish history. And it is, so my field of study was belonging, how to belong and become a citizen of a place and become completely integrated in the place and how people and of the, the people who already live in that place would accept you, right? And when you read about Jew, when you read Jewish history, you read about the various Jewish attempts to integrate and become, and not attempts. I mean, they were very, 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 very the Jewish people are the most successful people in the history of the world, I believe in integrating and contributing and becoming a part of the society that they live in. I mean, to the chagrin of the rabbis sometimes, right, Jason? I mean, but the Haskalah was fought tooth and nail in Germany by the rabbis. Zionism itself, modern Zionism, was is fought by many, many Haredi rabbis and the Naturi Karta movement and all of that. But the, the Jewish people, are very successful in integrating. The, you, for example, you look at Arabic. So in Arabic, Arabic is a language that really started with Muhammad and the Quran. Before that, there were like it was more of a dialect, and different tribes spoke. But Muhammad made it, and then the very first, the very first, like one of the very first published works in the Arab world. By was by Sadia uh, uh, Rab Sadia Gawon. Gawon, yeah. Arab, yeah, Gawon. Arabs call him Sadia Al Fayumi, and it is the Torah translated in Arabic at the time when even Arabic grammar wasn't invented. And then he, you have Maimonides, Ibn Maimun. You know, he goes on and he he does the guide for the perplexed in Arabic. Like you have the Jews contributing to the social, cultural, artistic life of the Muslim mid Arab Muslim Arab culture. You look at you look at Europe, you find the same story. You look at Germany, you find the same story. You look at the list of Nobel Prizes granted, you know, every year. You look at that list, most of it are Jewish scientists and intellectuals. Jews are very successful. They are very successful in integrating, and yet, yet, despite of that, despite of that, those attempts always failed when you had bigots who were anti-Semitic came in, somehow the populations turned on a dime, literally, against the Jews. It is one of the biggest mysteries in history to me. Why does that happen? And... I just we're seeing, it, we're seeing it played out right now. A few right now, ago, there are Jews who are marching in back Black Lives Matter protests. There were Jews that were involved in the human rights campaigns. Uh, I know. All this, all this, the, the the core of it. And then the second, and they marched in lockstep with many of these progressives. And next thing, Israel gets attacked, and they find out these were never their friends to begin with. Exactly, exactly. And so, you when you look at these things, you understand the reason that. The, the unity of the Jewish people is important. And you understand why Israel has the reaction it has, why Jews all over the world have the reaction they have to actions like the one we witnessed on October 7th, which is a day that will go in infamy. I don't think it's a day that served the Palestinian people well. I think it's the day that the Palestinian cause died I think things will never be the same afterwards. It, at the spiritual level, it's a huge, it's a huge injury. Uh, we've we've injured, you know, and I say we, you know, I'm a, I'm an American citizen, but as someone with Palestinian heritage, I'm telling you, 
we've injured the Jewish people in, in a way that I hope and pray we will find a way to mend somehow. And I think me saying this and being here is just one drop in this vast ocean of trying to make up for that. And, you know, to Jason and, you know, to whoever is listening. I think we need, we whoever did this, the Palestinians, the Hamas, the whoever cheered up for them, whoever thought of this as a great victory would repent. The, I mean, the patriarchs of Jerusalem issued this call to repentance to the Western world. And I got attacked. I went in. I usually do not comment on social media, but I watched that and I read the statement. It's a one page statement. And it does not, and these are Christians. And it, all it talks about are the children and the families in Gaza dying, and they are, and it's a tragedy. But what I wrote was, you cannot start a statement like this or start to address the issue and be credible unless you first acknowledge all the dead children, the dead, innocent, dead Israeli civilians, and even military personnel, to be honest, because in in Arab speech and Palestinian speech, we always say it's okay if you attack a soldier, it's it, you know, not attack civilians. And I'm saying a life is a life is a life. That soldier is a dad, is a brother, she's a sister, you know, they are all humans and they are all in my book, whether they carry a gun or not, they are civilians. So there is that call to repentance was should have included a call to those who committed those heinous crimes to repent because they were crimes. There is no other word to describe it. And it's unjustified in any way, shape or form, given all the context that you know underlies it, that the Palestinians, that the people of Gaza think underlies it. It wasn't justified and it just wasn't, wasn't needed and wasn't necessary and it was harmful. So I have two questions I want to ask to both of you. And this is just something I'm thinking, one, why weren't the people at the kibbutzes all armed? Why doesn't Israel have a Second Amendment, especially I, I, in light of, in light of the Holocaust? But this, then the second question I want to ask you to you is, should just Egypt just annex the Gaza Strip? Well, uh, Jason, should I should I take that one first? Is that OK with you? I talked to you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So here is here is the thing like. I asked my rabbi friend about this. I said, don't you have weapons at home? And he said, why should we have weapons? I think there was, the people in those kibbutzes, the way I understand it, are usually very friendly with the Gaza population. They employ them. They have them come over uh, when Israel opens the borders. And so I don't think, and I think the, the move, it, this, what you just said, underlies the stupidity of the move that Hamas made, because it is a move that is basically suicide. Everyone knows you can maybe surprise the Israelis at this moment and inflict damage. You can stab someone in the back, but they knew what would happen. And the, the people in the kibbutzes probably thought they will never do it. They will never be so stupid to do it, right? And so there was no need for armament. And there is the factor that it was Samhat Torah. It was, you know, one of those very happy holidays. And I think everyone's defenses go down. Like, think of us all on Christmas. Like, who who on Christmas would think a psycho? And these are this is what these people were. They were psychos. They were psychopaths. I've listened to some of the tapes uh, made by them. And these people were psychopaths. They were not freedom fighters. They were not resistance. They were simply psychopaths. So at Christmas here, we do not, you know, think a psychopath would walk through the door and start shooting at us. We wouldn't think it. And so, yeah, I think that's that's one reason. Now, the solution to Gaza, what would you do with Gaza? And I don't have an answer to that. Egypt annexing it. Egypt doesn't want to deal with it. Uh, there was a suggestion floated a while ago that uh, the Palestinian state should be in northern Sinai, send everyone there, and if you choose to stay in Gaza, you're a part of the state of Israel, it's fine. But then 
that's not going to happen. The Egyptians are not going to allow it. The two-state solution is impractical right now because there are too many settlements in the West Bank. Uh, there is too much bad blood. There is too much mistrust. The And again, I go back to the Palestinian Authority cannot be trusted. Hamas cannot be trusted. None of the Palestinian factions actually can be trusted. And there is no way of, of getting a trustable government. I mean, that requires like a change in the culture and teaching people about what a government looks like, a functioning government looks like. And and maybe elections, but then those elections will have influences. So it's it's very complicated. Living together in one state, you know, whatever you want to call it, Palestine, Israel is also impractical. I used to be, I used to be advocating for that, but then having I totally understand now, having studied all the relevant facts. I see why Israel has to be a Jewish state ruled by Jews and determined by Jews and lawmaking done by Jews. And not that not that it is completely that now, which is amazing because you have Arab legislators in the Knesset, right? They are a small, small minority, but then that door is open. But I don't see a way like with the current mindset in the Islamic world, the that I would see like a Muslim president of Israel one day, not uh, turning the balance and just taking over and and uh, trying to take over basically. I, that does, because again, this will be the soundbite probably my enemies will, will take. I don't see a way that with the current mindset and education, the Arab mind right now doesn't understand what democracy, a true democracy looks like. They do not understand it. You look at Iraq, you look at Libya, you look at Tunis, you look at Saudi, you look everywhere. You even look at the United Arab Emirates. That mindset is not there. We cannot have you know, the Arabic speaking people, the Middle Eastern people, North African Arabs cannot un, cannot have, do not have the maturity to have a democratic government because they do not have the, the willingness. And to be honest, there is that whole religious mindset that prevents it. And uh, Islam is a problem. I don't think you can have a democratic government. And again, I say this without... Racism. I'm not. I'm not an Islamophobe. My brother. You know, I have a brother who's a Muslim, right? My nephews are Muslims. My brother converted. He's a returned missionary converted to Islam. Okay. Oh wow. He lives in the United Arab Emirates. So I'm not an Islamophobe in any way, shape, or form. Right. There is a lot in in Islam that I love and respect. But Islam as a political framework is a failure. It was a failure even at the height of the Arab Muslim empire. It's a failure now. It will never work. We need to think from with, with the new mindset that is multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, that is similar to, I mean, take the Universal Declaration of Human Rights based on that, something like that, and say, all of us, religion does not play a role in determining the shape of your citizenship in a country. And Islam does not accept that. Islam does not accept it. And I challenge any Muslim to challenge me on that. You know, I challenge any Arab to challenge me on that. Eastern Christians feel the same way. You're either Russian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox or Coptic Orthodox, and there is no room for anyone else, right? Uh, you probably can use a Christian framework to bring those people in. But the Arab mind in general is too fractured, factional, tribal, and influenced by religion, and it wouldn't allow it. So you understand why the Israelis say this needs to be a Jewish state, and that's why we cannot have a demographically more numerous you know, Arab population combined with us because that would remove the idea of a Jewish state. Israel 
for the time being, and maybe forever, has to remain a Jewish state. We just need to find a framework that works where Arabs live peacefully, have self-determination within areas that they live in. And I think probably a hundred years have to pass before in it, b b for Arabs to prove, for Palestinians to prove, and Arabs in general to prove that they are able to build a stable economy, stable politics, uh, inclusive politics, peaceful politics, uh, in order for us to start talking about maybe a one state solution. But again, that might not happen. For now, Israel has to remain a Jewish state. It has to. There is there is no other way. Otherwise, what you will have is you'll have uh, scarred generations of Arabs just coming in. They it's like a boy with a new toy, and they wouldn't know what to do with it, and they will break it. And uh, and and that's that's a problem. Now, some 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 of my critics, when they hear this, they will say, "Oh, look at South Africa. You know the." South African blacks took over from the white government and nothing happened and they still continue. And, and I say, that culture is completely different. They don't have any of the religious you know, ideals. They don't have Islam basically ruling them. They have, they have a different framework to build on and that's why it worked in South Africa. But it's not gonna work in, in a place like you know, the Holy Land. It's not gonna work for the Palestinians and the Israelis. For now, you know, the idea of a Jewish state of them is a must. And the Arabs, the Palestinians in Gaza, the West Bank, you know, have to find a way to just build on what they have right now. And, uh, you know, one thing I keep telling people here in the United States, no matter what happens in national politics, the most important election you vote in is your city elections. Everything happens in your city and county, everything. Everything outside of your city and county, even at the state level, doesn't matter to you. Maybe state, but maybe something like this, self-determination for Palestinians in cities and counties that they currently have, open trade, and then we say, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Are you going to do what Arafat did or what Hamas did? Uh, they left Gaza and then you used all that money to build tunnels and arm ha with Arafat, the same thing, enrich yourself and buy limousines and stuff for people in the Palestinian Authority while the rest of the population struggles. Now, if you do that, why should we trust you, right? Uh, and, and that's wh when, you, when I sat with myself and started, when these things started unraveling, it, it, was, it was eye opening. It was very, very sobering. And I think every Arab needs to reach that point. Every Palestinian needs to reach that point. Because right now, we're just uh, hiding behind this, and I'm not minimizing it, but we're hiding behind this narcissistic form of grief that really lacks empathy. And it's really psychopathic. Uh, I told you I told you in our private conversation about the story about my professor who learned from Syracuse many years, you know, 30 years ago when Saddam invaded Kuwait. And he, you know, Saddam was threatening to throw anthrax rockets at Israel. And my professor, who's, you know, from Gaza, came and he said, I don't care if he throws anthrax. I have five babies, five children. I'll take them out to the balcony and mm -hmm. expose them to the anthrax if uh, that meant uh, we get uh, a free Palestine. And uh, no amount of land, no Aqsa Mosque, no Church of Nativity, no Church of Resurrection, none of the Christian, Muslim, you know, holy sites in that place is worth the blood, all the blood of the children who have died in the last few years. N none of it. None of it. It's brick, stone, and mortar, right? And th this this week, the Jewish world reads Parashat Noah, you know, and uh, and you read about the story of the Tower of Babel, and the Lord disperses the nations because they built this structure of brick and mortar so that they can reach God. And I feel that, you know, they call this recent war the Aqsa, the Aqsa flood or something. 
And I'm like, I'm sorry, the Aqsa Mosque isn't worth it, isn't worth all that blood. What, you're doing all this because a bunch of Jews asked to come in and pray in the mosque? Let them pray. What's wrong with them praying in the mosque? Open it up, let them pray. But this is this is the mindset, and it's narcissistic, pathetic, you know, and 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 just nihilistic. To be honest, it's just bad. I'm sorry, Jason. I speak too much. Oh, Jabra, thank you. I I mean, yeah, your it's your thoughts are so amazing because they they've been so um, blessed and inspired by uh, the truths of the restoration. You know, it's like. The restoration has just, you know, just immersed you, <laughs> and and the Lord's, you know, the light of Christ has truth has immersed shall set you. you free, Jason, the truth shall set you free, right? Yeah. So I I just I think um. I mean, I just want to say that <clears throat> at at the at the root of it, I personally view the Jewish people and the Palestinian people are both indigenous peoples to mm -hmm. the to the same land absolutely and, 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 i agree and that's what we're we're fighting about is because we both have lived in the land for for millennia yes. um and and yes there's this there's a religious component to it and you have judaism and you have islam um that are you know stirring up uh, a kind of religious um domination of the land um and i love that the the inklings of pluralism that you you know <laughs> this i this because i i think that the solution is religious pluralism the, yes, i mean we, are, we we the fact is the, our peoples the jewish people the palestinian people we're, we're already both indigenous to the land we've both been living in the land for millennia that we cannot change that Yes, my people were a minority, and then Zionism made us into a majority. But there are other times in history when we were the majority, and the Jewish people were the majority. So it ebbs and flows. But like you said, this beautiful, the, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Dome of the Rock, um, you know, it's a beautiful place where people connect to God. And, you know, why not a place of religious pluralism where Jews Absolutely. and Christian? Where Jews and Christians and Muslims, we all view this sacred site as holy to all of us. And there should be religious freedom and religious pluralism there that everyone can pray. Jews can pray. Christians can pray. Muslims can pray. Yes, the state of Israel has made some mistakes there. But overall, it's tried. It's in Israel's Declaration of Independence. To, pr to protect the holy places of all religions. So from my point of view, I want to hold the state of Israel to account to that, that you must protect the, the holy places of all religions. You must protect religious freedom, religious pluralism, and demonstrate that the state of Israel is not an enemy to Islam. Um, yeah. I, don't, I, I think that's what this whole beauty was. We were so close, and we were going to get there again. We were going to have... Uh, you know, Muslims from Saudi Arabia come to Jerusalem to go on a pilgrimage at, at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. How yeah. beautiful would that be for Muslims in the region to be able to come to Jerusalem peacefully to worship mm -hmm. at Al-Aqsa, along with peacefully with Jews and peacefully with Christians? This is the, religious freedom and religious pluralism is, this, is the solution. Um, as far as what you're saying with autonomy for Palestinian um, communities. Absolutely. The Palestinian people have the right to self-determination, just as the Jewish people. I think that they, they're mirrors. And that's what I've always tried to, to, to bring into the conversation, is that the Palestinian people have the right to govern themselves, just as the Jewish people have the right to govern themselves. And it's, it's complicated, the, the map at the moment, but this is how we live lives of dignity. And the, yeah. but the, the rhetoric right now is that overwhelmingly, especially in the universities, is the Jewish people have no right to self-determination, no right to a state, no right to defend themselves. And that is 
evil. Jason, I will <laughs> I will be rude and interrupt you here because I want to say something that you must hear about those demonstrations at universities. Those those kids are just so unwise. And I don't use this word lightly. I don't like to use you know derogatory words, but they are stupid because I would be out there if there was a demonstration to be held, I'll be out there, especially you being an Arab American, Palestinian American, whatever you know uh, you are, I would be out there with the Israeli, with the Jewish students holding up the banners with pictures of the kidnapped children and old people and demanding that they be released. It is their whole, I mean, I, I can't watch images from those demonstrations anymore. They depress me. They, they make me feel ashamed, I'm ashamed of them. They should be ashamed of themselves because they are not acknowledging the humanity of those, you know, of, of those uh, innocents who are held captive by Hamas. We cannot, Arab Americans, Palestinian Americans cannot expect the world to hear the voices of the children in Gaza or even demand a ceasefire without acknowledging the hostages. The hostages have to be returned for anything else to happen, for anything else to be possible. I mean, the, I understand the Israeli rage. If I had 200 citizens and I had 30 plus children in tunnels, old people, my heart went out for that old woman who got, just got released. I felt like I wanted to leap through the TV screen and give her a big hug and comfort her. Like, who does that? And she talks about being hit by a stick and being put in the back of a bike. No, I, th those demonstrations by the students uh, are just ill-advised, uh, stupid. And I'm surprised, like these, these kids are supposed to be intelligent. Lots of, they, they, their families pay lots of tuition for them to think critically, to think with empathy, to think with love. And they go out and do this. And that is not that is not how it should be. I'm sorry, Jason. I could... Well, Jabra, let me just say that the hope the hope for peace is not is not over. There are yeah. before October seventh, we had the spirit of peace moving mm -hmm. through the region, and and you are not alone, Jabra. Like I, I have to say that you are not alone. There are Arabs throughout the region that and the world that want peace. And prosperity and righteousness and morality. And we we cannot give up because what was happening was Arab country after Arab country was acknowledging what has always been true actually for millennia, that the Jewish yeah. people are their neighbors. And yes. as the first presidency said, to love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. It is a call. Both Jews and Arabs are neighbors. They, they have been for, for millennia. Love your neighbor as yourself. And and this is what is happening with the spirit of the Abraham Accords. Country after country was saying we are going to love our Jewish neighbors. We're going to trade with them. We're going to do peace with them. And what happened is Iran and Hamas yeah. and Hezbollah and no, Iran's proxies. To it, probably. And probably. And they said we cannot let this peace happen. Yeah, And they stirred up a war and they used and manipulated uh, but people again, in Gaza. Jason, yeah. here, here is the problem. If I was an Arab leader, if I was, you know, Mohammed bin Salman or the King of Jordan or whatever, they held the stupid summit again. I use the word stupid. Uh, and they denounced and got, into, got back to their de facto mode. What I would have done is I would have used to spoil this attack because you know Iranian hands are behind it. I would have actually speeded up uh, the, the peace accords. Like I would have sped up Saudi recognition of Israel. I would have given Benjamin Netanyahu a big prize to, if they cared about the children in Gaza, I would have said here, you don't need to retaliate. We're going to give you this 
peace accord with Saudi. Saudi will acknowledge Israel. Uh, will will pressure Kuwait. Will pressure the rest of the GC, GEC. You know the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC, to to have peace, and we will have a comprehensive peace accord with Israel. Yeah. You know, so that we will not reward the Iranians. Jordan would sponsor it. Egypt would sponsor it. I would yeah. have. I would have advocated for all of those leaders to be in support of Israel instead of sympathizing with Hamas or even the people of Gaza, to be honest, because in the long range, it is for the people of Gaza to do this. It is to spare them from this and show Hamas that their you know, ISIS tactics are not going to work. But unfortunately, yeah. Arab leaders because they are afraid of their own populations, and this is a topic for Steve for a whole other episode, right? They didn't want to do this, but they should have. If they really cared, I would have totally right. shown sympathy to Israel on this one. And well, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's over yet, Jabra. I don't think it's Hopefully over. Not. Hopefully there not. There is there is always there is always time for repentance, and I I know for a certainty. These Arab countries that have made peace with Israel, they want the region to re to return to peace and stability. Yes. And this is, I think, this is a last ditch attempt by Iran and its terrorist proxies to try to to see one last time if they can yes. destroy the Jewish people and yes. and kill them and exterminate them. And it's it's not going to happen. Mm. And when this is over, we will move forward in peace. And these these Arab countries will will re, will continue because they peace is good, and yes, and good. and prosperity is good. We and doing what's right is good. Chance. We need to give it a chance. We need we, yeah. like Hezbollah, Iran, <laughs> all of these people. They've tried. They've tried. They've tried, and it's it didn't work. And to be honest, the Palestinian people should see like this is. I hate to say this word experiment. But if this was an experiment, you've seen that violence doesn't work. And you've seen that keeping the status quo only enriches people like the Palestinian Authority and Hamas leadership, keeps them in power, and it's doing nothing for you, and you wouldn't play along with it. I would, if I was a Gaza civilian, I, I would basically go looking for where all those hostages are hidden, and I would be informing the Israelis about that. I mean, th that's that's what they should see. But again, we're stuck. We're stuck. There is a generation that's been indoctrinated with hate, vengeance, you know, that they see no other way. And to be honest, education is a big problem. Education is a yes. huge issue. And it's right now, a price is being paid for this by those children, by children on the Israeli and Arab side. And the yeah. Palestinian side, so I know it's. But I, but I think we need we need to engage. The whole region needs to be engaged. Mm -hmm. This is not this is not just a conflict between Israelis and and Hamas. It's not localized. It, the entire region needs to integrate to come to a peaceful resolution. We you know we we ha this is the test to use the Abraham Accords, because otherwise it's just the the big powers, the United States, my country. China, Russia, coming in, but the, the the region, the children of Abraham, we can solve our own problems. Yes. Isaac and Ishmael were able to to love each other and embrace each other, right? When when yes. Abraham died, my brother, when Abraham died, Ishmael came home. Yes, and Absolutely. Isaac and Ishmael laid their father to rest. Yeah, and we can do it. You know, yes. this is the thing. This is the thing. The Book of Mormon, our scriptures can provide the framework for this to operate. We have to realize that in the Book of Mormon, you have what is a proto millennium happened. What happened? There were no matter of ites. Yes. They, they, no, this was I... a time of peace. So we need to get rid of all this stuff, the ites, that has to go. We all have yep. to recognize that we're all children of God and that the three great Abrahamic religions, we need to, we can come together because our own scriptures show us the pathway of how this can be done 
Yeah, so here is here is the thing, Steve. So there is this theory in philosophy by this by this American philosopher. His name is John Rawls. It's called the uh, the it's called he calls it the theory of justice. But one of its tools, it's a thought experiment. It's called the veil of ignorance. And in the veil of ignorance, you imagine yourself in in the world, and you don't know anything about which is very difficult for us to do right, right as humans but it's a thought experiment like an einstein thought experiment and you imagine yourself in a world without context without knowing who without knowing who jason is without knowing who jabber is without knowing who steve is and you're presented with a problem and you're you're told give me a solution to this problem and the solution you're going to come up with is the solution that you would want for yourself, right? It's basically the Savior's teaching or Hillel's teaching, which is do unto others what, uh, don't do unto others what you don't like done to you or do unto others what you would like done to you, right? Th that's what the thought experiment always defaults to. But then there is also this concept in, in German philosophy, unfortunately, I'm going to have to use him because even though he was uh, he was a part of the Nazi party for a little bit, Heidegger had some great thoughts. And uh, he had this idea of thrownness. You're thrown into the world in a situation, right? And then you have, you have all that baggage and you have to learn how to overcome that baggage to achieve authenticity and and free yourself from that baggage and you know go towards a brighter future and i feel that these are the frameworks that we have to be working with even though they're difficult we have to figure out a way to say let us forget about which is difficult again but let's forget about the pogroms let's forget about Islam, let's forget about Muhammad, let's forget about all of that stuff, all of that ideology, and sit together and say, what do we want for the children? What do we want? One thing I find very interesting in the story of the Camp David Accords is when, you know, Menahim Begin and Anwar Sadat. When I was a child growing up, the name Menahem Begin was, you know, basically you said Menahem Begin to describe someone as evil and the devil and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you grow up with that image. But, you know, I've, I've read a, bio, a few biographies of Begin and I really like him. Surprise, I love Menahem Begin. I think he was the right leader at the right time and he was the right leader to have peace with Egypt. But there is a moment when he is being Manahim Begin. He's in the Haganah. He was in the Haganah. He was one of the founders of Israel. A very tough, very, a very tough Zionist. And then you have Anwar Sadat. And they just can't come to an agreement. And Jimmy Carter gets them involved. And Jimmy Carter is an evangelical I really adore. Uh, not his politics, not his years in the White House. I adore his biblical teachings. Uh, he he started them into a conversation about their grandchildren, and that is the conversation that got the Camp David Accords accomplished, because they started thinking about the future of these children. They started from a totally new perspective and point of view, you know, as grandpas, as grandfathers, and they went from there. And I feel we need a moment like this between the Jewish people and the Palestinian people to sit together, you know, eating stuffed grape leaves, eating some hummus and falafels and exchanging recipes. You know, I was listening last night and I rarely delve into the TikTok swamp, but my sister loves sen sending me things. And I go there and there is this, uh, and I can't turn it on right now, but th th there is a you know, Mizrahi Jews praying and, you know, the, the, they are chanting a Jewish prayer to a Palestinian villager, you know, music, to Palestinian villager music. So they are chanting it, you know, with Palestinian music. And I was, I listened to that, you know, looped it probably a hundred times. And that's the kind of, we need to start from common points. 
and discover each other. This, like Jason and I have no problem. We have the restored gospel. It combines us. We have the vocabulary to talk to each other. The average uh, Jew in Israel, the average Palestinian uh, in the West Bank in Gaza, they haven't developed those common those co that common vocabulary, and that's what needs to happen for us to have to, to start talking about peace in the common future. Hmm. Jabra, let me just let me just say, you know what we we can move forward from this to, to keep working on restoring this golden age between Arabs and Jews. It, yeah. it We've had it in the past. You mentioned Maimonides and uh, Said. Uh, uh, um, Gaon and yeah, Gaon. there is more. I mean, what's his name? Yeah, Saadi ibn Gaon. Mosa Halevi, you know, in, in Spain. Yeah. It, it goes on and on. It goes on and on. But let me, let me just say that the age, the age of empires has ended. Yes. Right. So when we had these golden ages of Arabs and Jews as loving each other as neighbors, we've done it in the past, in yes. the millennia past. But the yeah. age of empires is over. And so now we live in the age of, of nation states. And so yes. the Jewish people of the region have regathered in Israel as a nation state. But the same feelings and the same cooperation and the same peace, can, we can we can get back to that. And that's that's what's happening. That's what's happening in the world of Islam. Say, it, it, you know, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and Morocco. They're saying we have always had Jews in the region. Mm -hmm. We have always had Jewish neighbors. So, and Islam has tolerated the Jewish neighbors. And so, yeah. what if our Jewish neighbors have constituted themselves into a nation state? So have we. Because it's also the Arab nation states that need that are seeking a future as well. And and all that Hamas and ISIS and Iran, all they want to do is go back to an age of empires. Yes. Where people do not have self determination. We have to reject that. It's Absolutely. that that age is over. That's what this violence is. It's about returning to empire. And we have to say yeah. no. Yeah, mm. we have to say no and we have to just tell like tell Muslims, you know, there is no Islamic caliphate. It's not, that's not happening anytime soon. There is no Islamic empire. There is no such thing anymore. It's it's it it's against it's against who we are now uh, in the world. We, it's it's against us. People don't think that way. We live in a globalized age with internet, with you know instant communication, with technology the whole um, um, uh, empirical imperial vision does not work anymore it does not work anymore so yeah i agree with you and just one final note that word tolerate i don't like it we need to love and accept and embrace and unite with each other it needs to be genuine it's not we shouldn't feel like oh i'm just tolerating you because it's the thing to do I embrace you. I love you. You are my equal in this world. You are my brother. You are my sister, right? That's yeah. that's what the gospel teaches us. It's beyond toleration. We need to love and accept each other. Wow. Guys, yes. I have to tell both of you. First of all, I think I may have asked three or four questions max on this entire interview. You guys, <laughs> just, are, you guys are great. And, and the analysis you're giving, I will say that I will put up I'll, the stuff that this channel has put out about the Israeli conflict since it started <clears throat> and my appearances on the Hemias program. I'll put I'll put my what we've done is as I think is as good as anything that I've seen anywhere else. I'm really proud of the the people that have come on. Jason, I'm really proud to have you as a friend. I'm really proud to have a new friend in Jabra. I I, yeah. I, I this this channel is about having adult conversations and bringing people to the table. I also want evangelicals to hear this conversation. For those of you who continue to attack Latter-day Saints by saying, one, they w worship another Jesus or they follow another gospel. <laughs> you tell me where you can say that these men follow another gospel or another Jesus. Okay, so I want to challenge the evangelical bigots <laughs> who hate uh, Latter-day Saints taking you to the table too okay this is yeah. this is real this yeah. is this all i can tell all i can tell my evangelical brothers and sisters is i love them and yeah. i don't yeah. 
regardless of what they say about Latter-day Saints, I used to be a Nazarene Baptist briefly for a few years, and I, I love evangelicals. I love, you know, on my shelves, I have mo actually more evangelical commentaries and books than I have Latter-day Saint books, and that is a truth. <laughs> uh, so so I, I, I'm a big fan. I think there is a lot of truth in evangelical teachings. I love what they bring to the world. I think we have this these differences in theology, but here is a th great thing about the atonement of Jesus Christ. It J the Savior will make it all whole in the end, and we will all be together. We 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 have that common bond with with all of the all of the evangelicals, and that is we acknowledge Jesus as Savior and Lord. He yeah. is the Savior of the world. He atoned for our sins. We accept him. We love him, and and and. The evangel evangelicals I know would take that and say, yes, you are one of us, right? We can differ in theology, but this is at the core of it. We accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, period. No Latter-day Saint would, would debate that. It's period. Now, we might disagree on the nature of God. We might disagree on who he is. All of these things... In the millennium, in the the resurrection, we will we will know, but the the fact is, we know Jesus is Savior. Jesus is Lord. We accept Him. He's our personal Savior. A, a Mormon would say that with an evangelical with the same conviction. Hey, Steve, let me Steve, let me say that. Thank you, Jabra. Let me say that what you are doing, Steve, is you are creating a big tent for all the children of Abraham. Uh, I, 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 I'm sure this term has been used, but we are, what we're doing is a kind of Abrahamic pluralism. You know, whether you're a Jew and you follow Moses, or you're a Christian and you follow Jesus, or you're a Muslim and you follow Muhammad, peace these are all him. within, peace be upon him, thank you. Uh, these are all, peace be upon each of them, right? Um, these are all part of the big tent of Abraham's family. And we have to have an intra-Abrahamic dialogue. And it's, it is it is happening in the Middle East. It's just this is, is stopping it. And it, it, the, the war is bleeding out into college campuses across the world. And we can't have the children of Abraham, Jews, Christians, and Muslims fighting and killing each other. Our father Abraham would, is just devastated. And we this yeah. th this channel is is a place to to make Abraham had a very big tent. He not only Rahel is mourning for her children, also Sarah yes. is mourning for her children. You know, I mean, it's it's horrendous what's happening. And remember, Sarah would probably be even more uh, more devastated with all that's happening because she had the one she had the one child right and. So she would be Ra yeah, Rachel, Rachel, yeah. Well, yeah, Rachel, Sarah, you know, the yeah. matriarchs would be devastated by this. Yes, Rachel yeah, yes. for all the dead, dead Jews, Sarah for all the dead Arabs and Jews. I mean, Rebecca would be. I mean, all of them, all of them would be. This is th this bloodshed is not for whatever reason this thing started. It wasn't worth it. Like life is precious. Those children yeah. are precious. So gentlemen, thank I you. want to say thank, amen to that. I would say anybody who is against to, uh, peace in the Middle East, those who would want to disrupt the, the peace process are satanic. And that's how we need to yeah. look at it. This yeah. is really a battle between good and evil. And typically folks, you know me, I'm pretty down the middle, but I told, uh, I said, there are a few places where there are a few hills, hills that I'm willing to die on. I'm willing to die on the for my my brothers and sisters uh, of the restoration, and I'm willing to die on that hill for the Jewish people, but also for all the great the, all the people of the book. Okay, so that's the main thing. So let's just remember. Let's put that in perspective as well. Our common humanity, the fact that we are all image bearers, and don't forget that, and that we are all our children of Abraham. 
Folks, I want to hear what you have to say in the comments. I want to thank these two fine gentlemen for participating in this conversation. I am very proud of the work that we're doing here. And I'm hearing from people throughout the world. <laughs> and, and to even have a contact in Gaza and recognize the humanity of Muhammad. And I love you, Muhammad, and I wish you the best. And uh, we have people praying for you, okay? I love you, brother, very much, okay? So folks, just remember, this is what it's all about. Coming together, having a common place. Don't forget my Utah Interfaith uh, Facebook group, my new Utah Interfaith uh, YouTube channel, just getting started. I know Interfaith is very complex. It's not an easy subject, but I know that that's what God wants me to do, okay? So just remember, the most important thing is this, folks. Remember, all the voices of the Restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.